Hey, welcome to the shop. Today we're talking about welding gas and we're gonna go over everything from what types of gases to use for different processes and materials, what size cylinder is gonna be the best fit for you, um, what the markings on the cylinders mean and some things to look out for if you're buying your cylinder secondhand, and also where to even buy your gas and what it's like going to get a refill. We'll start by talking about what type of gas to use in different situations. And we'll start with the easy one and that's TIG welding because TIG welding allows you to use the same gas for any metal. And that's one of the big benefits uh, in my mind. You can switch between steel, aluminum, stainless steel, even metals like copper without ever changing your gas cylinder where if you're MIG welding, it, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, you pretty much need a different gas for every application. Now the gas that I'm going to recommend for TIG is going to be 100% argon. That is the standard across the board. Now if you rewind back close to a century ago, it was called Heliarch in the patent that I think initially was issued to Northrop and then it ended up with Lindy and maybe Aesop after that. I, I don't remember exactly. Um, but Heliarch was the name because helium was the gas that was used. And helium is still used in some special situations today because it gives you a hotter arc specifically on aluminum. So if you need to weld really thick aluminum, you can get a huge bump in your heat uh, for the same amount of amperage. And so you might be wondering, well, why wouldn't I want to do that? Well, when you run a helium, one, you need to run a higher gas flow, and two, Helium is really expensive if you can even get your supplier to sell it to you. You know, some will, some won't um, anymore, but uh, it's, it's very expensive and hard to come by. And it's a lot cheaper to have a higher amperage machine than to buy helium regularly. That being said, if you do need to get away with welding some really thick aluminum, adding some helium in with your argon uh, might be a good bet in a pinch like that. And you can even weld thick aluminum on DC pretty well if you're running helium. So keep that in mind. But generally speaking, argon is going to be best for TIG across the board. Now let's talk about MIG welding or gas metal arc welding. And this one is much more complicated. Now there are actually a lot of different variants of MIG welding. I'm calling them all MIG welding. Technically, some of them aren't. Now what most people are running when they talk about MIG welding is a short circuit transfer mode. And that means that your wire actually goes out of the gun, bumps against the metal, burns back in an arc, and that arc gets so long that it goes out and that process repeats over and over again. Now for that, you're going to be best off running 75% argon, 25% CO2. I mean, roughly other parts of the world, um, there are different standards, but here in the US, 75 argon, 25% CO2 is gonna be the standard gas for that and what I'd recommend for most people. You can also run 100% CO2 um, for short circuit MIG and that works just about as well in a lot of large industrial situations. They'll do that to save cost because CO2 is cheaper than the 75-25 blend. But from my experience, if you're buying it in relatively small cylinders like the ones that I use here, um, it's just about the same price because a small percentage of the actual cost of your refill is the gas itself. So you might as well run the 75-25, but 100% CO2 will work there, as will another gas that we're going to talk about in a minute. So what are some situations where you wouldn't want to run 75 argon, 25% CO2? Well, the first one is if you're MIG welding aluminum. Now, aluminum needs 100% argon to uh, run with MIG. And so if you have a TIG already, you're going to be set up. But if you don't, that's going to be another cylinder that you're going to need to go along with a spool gun or special setup for aluminum if you just want to MIG weld it. Now, if you're running stainless steel, that's yet another gas. And traditionally, that's a trimix gas that's based on helium. But anymore, that's being replaced by a blend of 98% argon and about 2% CO2. Um, and that can be used pretty effectively on stainless steel instead of a trimix. It's not quite as clean, but it still works. And the last reason that you wouldn't want to use um, the 7525, even if you are welding steel, is if you want to run a spray transfer or a pulsed spray transfer, which basically means that your arc is on all the time, and that 7525 gas isn't really able to do that as well, at least until you get into really high amperages, and so you need a different gas for that. Now, the old school answer for that 
um, is going to be about 95 to 99 percent argon and the rest of it will be oxygen that's right oxygen in the shielding gas and that's still a good option if you're running straight spray transfer but what if you want one gas that can run spray transfer or pulse spray as well as a short circuit transfer mode that's where 90 percent argon 10 percent co2 comes in and it runs great on spray it runs great on short circuit transfer usually just have to adjust your voltage down a little bit from 75 25. in general argon for tig 75 argon 25 co2 for mig um, unless you have one of those special situations let's dive into cylinder sizes because they come in a lot of different sizes so there's some trade-offs here so smaller cylinders cost less up front and they're easier to handle um, but they cost more for the amount of gas uh, that you actually get with each exchange so if you're doing a lot of welding um, and you're in a shop setting a larger cylinder is going to be better if you're doing something really portable or not much welding then a small one might be fine now larger cylinders are heavy and they're bulky they're cheaper for the amount of gas um, but another thing to consider is a lot of gas suppliers won't work with customer owned cylinders um, in larger sizes so you have to pay a lease fee from the gas supplier to be able to uh, rent or lease the larger cylinders versus owning uh, the smaller ones I own all of my cylinders I don't want to pay a lease fee um, but sometimes that can be uh, not too bad of a thing they're usually not too expensive honestly so these that I run here are 125 cubic foot cylinders I have a whole bunch of them they're easy to handle they're large enough that the gas is fairly economical it's about 60 bucks for me to get one refilled um, where I go and I have one larger cylinder on a TIG welding machine but other than that they're all these 125s and that's a pretty good size now if you're a MIG welding hobbyist the next size down from this like an 80 cubic foot um, is also a really good choice and these are really common to be able to have as owned cylinders you can actually calculate how much welding you can do just by taking the cubic feet in a cylinder and, and it's going to be a rough calculation but the cubic feet in a cylinder and dividing that by your flow rate which in most cases is somewhere around 25 unless you're doing some like heavy spray transfer or you have a big cup on a TIG welder for titanium or something but most of the time 25 is kind of in the ballpark so 125 cubic foot cylinder that will let you get about five hours of arc on welding time which is quite a bit of fabrication but you can see how that wouldn't go too far if you're welding professionally all day every day I mean if you go like most of my work as a welding engineer has been in aerospace facilities and uh, those all have had supply lines piped in from a silo out back that provides argon for welding as well as heat treat furnaces so you know in those cases you're talking a lot of argon on pipelines they often have what they call a 12 pack with a dozen big 300 cubic foot cylinders all on a pallet um, that they pipe out there for them there, so there are options there or if you have a 250 or 300 cubic foot cylinder you can get quite a bit more arc time but if you're just doing like general fabrication these 125s last pretty good especially for hobby stuff automotive stuff things like that now let's talk about the different markings that you'll find on the cylinders themselves in fact let's just go over and take a look at some of the markings on the cylinders that I have there's really just two that you need to pay real close attention to okay these numbers right here aren't very important from an end user perspective this is just a, this one that starts with DOT this is just your spec right here and it has a rated pressure um, that's important for those who refill it right here is your serial number and the original inspection date this is from 1985 it's kind of fun to see how old they are sometimes I've had some really really old cylinders I've ended up with um, but what's more important is the expiration or the most recent inspection date so let's go around to the other side so this is what you need to be paying attention to especially if you're buying a used cylinder so there's this row of dates right here and the way these work is you have a month and a year and in between those that's kind of the inspection facility but uh, anyway so this is 08 of 2024 so this one was just redone and then you have a couple other marks that matter this plus means that it's approved for a 10 percent overfill on the pressure 
and the star means that it's good for 10 years plus this date. If it doesn't have a star there, it's only good for five years. So this would be 2029. Since it has the star, this is good till 2034. So if this is out of date, when you take it back to your gas supplier, they might charge you a few bucks for a hydro test. It usually isn't that big of a deal, um, but it can be a little bit of an extra cost. I just want to point out one more thing right here. This is your neck ring. Notice how this is bare. There's no writing here. This is where the original owner of the cylinder will be written. So a bare neck cylinder is typically a customer owned cylinder. Now, even though I own all my cylinders, some of them aren't bare neck cylinders. See this one right here says Whitmore Oxygen. It was originally owned by Whitmore Oxygen, but just ended up in the rotation. Uh, my gas supplier will exchange most of them, no matter what it says but there are a few that they won't. Um, so be sure to ask your supplier if they'll exchange it if you're purchasing one secondhand and it doesn't have a bare neck on it. So pay attention to the last hydro test date and the neck ring and make sure that you'll be able to exchange it. So that just comes down to calling and asking your supplier. Now, if it is out of hydro test, that's usually not a deal breaker. It can just be a little bit of an extra fee or in some cases, they, they don't even pay attention to it and they just take them in on exchange and then process them through and they'll run the hydro test if they need to. Now let's talk about where to get them. There are a lot of different gas suppliers in my area and most areas and the cost for small customers like me varies a ton. Where I go um, is about one third the cost of one of the big name chains and it's uh, about 30% less than the next uh, competitor out of the big chain. So often the small mom and pops, they treat small customers better and don't gouge you on prices. Um, so it's worth calling around to see. Now, when you're initially buying your cylinder, if you wanna own it, the last two that I've bought, I purchased online and they just shipped right to me. It was really easy and then when they ran out, I took them and exchanged them for a new one at the gas supplier, no issues at all. Now I get a lot of questions about the process for having your cylinders refilled and nowhere that I've ever lived have they actually just refilled your cylinder right on site when you go there. Um, everywhere has been like a distribution center and so you just go and you exchange your cylinder for another one that's full of the same size and then pay the fee and then you take that. So it's still a customer owned cylinder. I still own them. Um, however, uh, it's a different one every time I exchange it. Now let's just talk for a minute about uh, cylinder handling. Whenever you have a cylinder that isn't uh, secured or strapped to a cart or a rack or something like that, be sure to keep the cap on the top because if that tips over and breaks off the valve, they can go shooting like a rocket and that can be pretty dangerous. Um, also, I just wanted to touch on acetylene cylinders. They are a little bit different uh, than the high pressure gas cylinders because the acetylene um, in them is actually dissolved in acetone and that is soaked into like a sponge. And so, you have to use them sitting upright where most compressed gas cylinders, they can actually sit sideways when you use them, uh, unless you're using like a welding truck or something like that, you wouldn't usually do that. But uh, anyway, they can, but not acetylene cylinders. So if you have an acetylene cylinder and you transport it laying down, which uh, you can generally do, it has to be sitting upright for a certain amount of time before you can use it uh, like that. I like to just keep mine upright all the time. So just keep that in mind that if you don't keep those acetylene cylinders upright and have them upright for a certain amount of time before you use them, that can damage your equipment and also lead to some unsafe conditions. Hey, if you are just getting started with welding and fabrication, I've put together some affordable online courses. They're $39 for a course. There's one for MIG, one for TIG, one for STIC. And uh, if you buy all of them, it's available at a deep discount in a bundle. In these courses, I get you away from just watching videos and out into your shop doing focused practice exercises um, that teach you one fundamental skill at a time. So you don't get overwhelmed, you master one thing and then move on to the next and you get the exact information they need exactly when you need it. You'll find those linked down in the description. I give a full money back guarantee. Returns are very rare, but if you do find that it's not for you, uh, there's no questions asked, no hard feelings, just shoot me an email, I'll give you your money back. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.